Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 90 of Libraries in Response. Uh, let me get a screen share up here. There we go. Very good. So, uh, yes, thank you for coming. Uh, session 90 in our series here, uh, further, farther, beyond the walls with public access. This is a, a subject near and dear to us uh, for a long time. And uh, so we'll hear three stories, hopefully today. <laughs> We're scheduled for them anyway. Uh, from New York Public Library, from the Balvern Hot Spring County Library System, and also from the Orange County California Library System. The images we're using for this are uh, from the uh, the Malvern uh, Library and the New York City Library. We were struck by the the similarity of the spaces, the feeling that these images portray as welcome, well lit spaces in such very, very different kinds of environments, uh, you know, community environments, and yet the commonality of, uh, of libraries. We were just struck by that and we love these images. So uh, thank you for that. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're 13 year old uh, uh, project, uh, uh, a consortium, an open consortium of libraries anywhere, US and beyond. Uh, working with emerging technologies, uh, information communication technologies to improve and extend services. And this has been our, our passion uh, actually since 2007 when we uh, started our, our advocacy for libraries and their role in society and, and community health and well-being. Uh, our host and recording the sessions is and has been the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in The Hague with the head of public policy, Stephen Weiber at the helm. Once again, Stephen, thank you. And our sponsor for the series this, this year, our about to enter our fifth year of libraries in response is uh, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. And we thank them for helping make it this series available this year. Uh, we began in response to the pandemic in March of, of 2020, when everybody was going crazy, uh, what this all meant. We were all closed down and, you know, we just didn't know. Uh, people were dying in large numbers and it was a full scale global overnight mobilization. We've just never seen anything like that ever. Uh, you know, pandemics have been around, but they they spread much more slowly because of the communication, the transportation systems, and even world wars take longer uh, to get around than than this pandemic did. And it seems to us it created a shock to people, to humanity, if you will. Uh, and maybe we're still recovering from that. I think the the, the, the COVID pandemic continues to morph. Uh, it seems to be less lethal, of course, but it's not gone away and there's still a lot of people suffering from it. The point was that libraries needed to respond to a crisis, a sudden crisis that was everywhere and they had to close their doors. I'm telling you nothing, You've all, you all lived through this, but then they responded, they figured out what, well, okay, the building is closed, but we're not actually closed. So what does that mean? How can we change our services? And so that led to a whole series of innovations that we've heard about over the last four years. Uh, that was a crisis. Since then, we've had one crisis after another. It seems like they've been nonstop. So this term is out in the world, polycrisis. It stands for not just one after another, but a whole gang of crises that seem to be interconnected and mutually reinforcing. So this is kind of our favorite symbol for that as the world is longing for the good old days of merely nuclear dilation, which is not that old if we've been reading the news uh, with the possibility of nuclear weapons at orbit. So 
things are intense um, and libraries are being challenged to step up every time to something happens. And you do. It's amazing. You never say no. And there's a lot to you know say yes to here. And, and you're doing it. And our job is to try to support that. Broadband is one of the ways that that happens. Uh, tens of millions of people in the U.S., at one time close to 80 million people in the U.S. rely on libraries for library, for, for uh, Internet access. But the thing was, they had to go to one of the 17,000 facilities to access that service. And while it's great that it's there, it's essential that it's there, it's still, you know, a trip for a lot of people and not convenient. So libraries have ex been extending that service out into the community in different ways. And that's what we're going to hear about today. This is the, this is the, um, the partnership for public access and it's uh, statement about the necessity of broadband. And those are the partners in that, in that partnership. So the main barriers to adoption are usability, affordability and availability. Usability is of course the skills, the equipment, you know, understanding. It's a big catchphrase for a lot of things, but all of those things libraries tend to provide. You know, they support and devices help you set up webmail. All these things that that are, are barriers to a lot of people. A lot of people libraries provide affordability is another library solution. It doesn't mean that. That uh, connectivity is in your back pocket all the time, so increasingly we're starting to see things like that. But it does mean that it, like with books themselves, it's a solution to the affordability challenge, where we can't all have all the books that we want to have at our beck and call. So what do we do? We pool our resources at a community, we create a library, and we acquire these resources and then share them. Not everybody has them all the time. There's a limit to it, but it's a resource. It's a critical resource it's, that has helped so many people for so many years. Availability then is uh, kind of the question for this. And so without availability, affordability and usability are moot questions. They really are irrelevant because, you know, it doesn't matter if it's free, if you can't get to it, it, it still doesn't matter. And so this is where our work has been, is extending that availability through a, a variety of technologies, that, that access being essentially library Wi-Fi. That's how most of us, nearly all of us connect to that, to that service, whether we're in the building or around the building or we're being, the Wi-Fi is being delivered through a range of other communications technologies. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we're connecting to, and that's what people really depend upon. We've worked on this uh, for about the last 10 years, specifically in the use of wireless technologies to extend library access or you know, a, a back end to deliver Wi-Fi on the front end is effectively what this has been about. The, the, the premise of second nets is that it's a play on on FirstNet, which you may not be aware, is a national first responders network. So police, fire, ambulance, uh, they've all had their different communication systems. They don't work alike. And so this was an effort to, to create an interoperability platform for all of these first responders so they could communicate with each other. It makes a lot of sense. It's a big project. Well, okay, that's great. That's terrific. But in large scale disaster events, First responders are are overwhelmed. They really, you know, they're not irrelevant, but they just cannot deal with the scale of the event. This is where second responders come into play, uh, shelters and recovery units and so forth. And libraries and schools uh, fall into that category. There, there are places where people can go when the lights are out. Presumably the library has backup power and hopefully their, their connectivity is on. And people can get access, get information, even get just shelter. They also act as distribution points. So it's a vital role. Another one that libraries have been given without asking for it, because uh, we, we this was a uh, proposal we did for IMLS uh, several years ago. 
And one of the responses we got, well, why should we do that? And our answer was, well, they're going to show up like it or not, because that's what people think of doing is when they have a problem, they don't know how to solve it. They tend to go to the library because that's a place you can get answers and information and communication and even electricity to recharge your devices is the way that worked out. So we, this project supported the grant we got from ILS to do this, supported a number of sub projects that using different wireless technologies. So CBRS is, uh, is, a uh, uh, a very hot, uh, popular new mm, metro area scale wireless. It's uh, uh, a, a, lo a lot of new DYI uh, self-built network built networks are using it. I believe New York City has been used that. We'll hear from Garfield shortly about what exactly their technology is. EBS is Educational Broadband Services. This was uh, this was set up. You know, when spectrum wasn't thought to be as valuable as it is now that we all have phones. And so a large amount of spectrum was dedicated just to educational institutions to build their networks and support their their uh, populations. It's been difficult for them to do that. And a lot of them have li sub licensed that technology off to carriers who then commercialize it and pay the, the institutions for that use. Well, the FCC stepped in and said that's really not what it was about. And so they pulled a lot of that back and then resold it. Uh, you know, this is an ongoing thing. Spectrum is really precious commodity and it's extremely complex to manage. It's amazing what, <laughs> what kind of technology is underneath the management of this. Uh, we also have traditional uh, uh, Wi-Fi. That's the five and now six gigahertz that we use to connect in our homes and our offices and so forth directly to our devices which have that technology built in. Uh, and then the uh, the other uh, technology we explored and funded were, were LEO satellites, low earth orbit satellites. Pretty exciting technology because traditional satellites have not been good for two-way communication. Great for broadcast, you know, anywhere on the planet, pretty much. Uh, that's how we all experienced it, you know. But these satellites in geosynchronous orbit are pretty far out, like, three times the diameter of the earth around 20 something thousand miles out. And so the lag time for the signal is too slow. It's just the speed of light is just not fast enough to get out and back without a delay. Low earth orbit or somewhere in the range of a few hundred miles up. And so that lag is very small and latency is the term is very low, making it usable for all the traditional functions that we do phone, uh, gaming, anything that needs uh, uh, fast interaction. So the dominant player in this, of course, is Starlink, uh, a subsidiary of, of uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Starlink, a subsidiary of SpaceX, and they have deployed thousands of these satellites. They have to have so many because in low Earth orbit, they have to keep moving to stay up, and that means they go out of range uh, quickly. They just kind of crisscross. So just imagine thousands of satellites at uh, three, 400 miles up, just crisscrossing all around the planet with more thousands uh, being planned. And they're not the only ones. There are more systems like this coming up. Uh, so this is, this is a really disruptive technology. That's what the nature of technology is. New technologies come along and disrupt uh, the older technologies, displace them, usually, or just change the business models that causes things to happen. Uh, besides the technology, the, we also focus on the partnerships. That is to say, uh, it's very reasonable for, in the term of second nets, for schools and libraries and clinics and other uh, anchor institutions to combine to create their own secondary backup network. So the dual use here is to both extend access, improve the convenience of access to these public services, as well as to increase the resilience against disaster. So having these systems up with power, backup power, is invaluable when the proverbial hits the fan because everything goes out. Maybe the cell system remains up. Maybe it doesn't, but maybe it's up, but it's in overloaded because it's the only thing in town. And after, after, you know, 24 hours, 
what do we do? Uh, we've got to recharge our phones, even if the cell system is up and, and working. We had, an, uh, we had a power outage here several years ago. I'm just north of San Francisco in uh, Marin County, and there were fires further north in Sonoma County. And so the utility cut the power in our county. A quarter million people were just suddenly cut off with no notice. <laughs> it lasted for five to seven days. I mean, everything was fine, but we had no electricity. It was an experience. You know, after a few hours, you start to think about what's in the freezer. And then you start to wonder when it's going to come back on. And then you start inviting people over for dinner and they invite you. And, and then you start to think about where you're going to get your, your phone recharged. What happened was that people went to community hubs like the library or community center that were on that had backup power and had connectivity. And you'd walk into one of these places and it'd be just packed with people, daisy chained on power strips, recharging their phones and using the connectivity if it could support that many people. And it was really interesting to see all these people suddenly together <laughs> in a crisis where you could really tell there was a crisis going on, other just the lights were out. So that gets much more intense when there's a flood or a fire, or a hurricane or you know, any earthquake any number of storms. And in our current environment, with the climate being uh, what it is becoming, we are experiencing these uh, severe events at greater frequency and increased severity. So uh, we've touched on that uh, quite a bit, uh, but, and we will continue to because there's no escaping it. So let's get to it. Thank you for indulging me for uh, an extended kind of uh, uh, opening. It's just because public access and, and getting beyond the walls with access is a, a, a favorite topic of ours. So um, we have uh, three presenters today. I haven't seen Dan yet. Oh, here he is. Hey, Dan. Uh, we're going to start off with Claire, Claire Graham, the director of the Malvern Hot Spring County Library in Arkansas. And, uh, and then Garfield will follow and then Dan will uh, come in third. So I'm going to stop share. I am going to thank Claire uh, for uh, coming on to tell us the story of how you've extended access in your county. Welcome, Claire. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, like Dawn yep. said, my name is Claire Graham. Okay. Um, I'm the director of the Malvern Hot Spring County Library. Can you hear me okay? Just fine. Okay, good deal. Um, so I became, I want to start by saying how I knew of the need in our county. So in 2018, our county judge began a 10-year strategic planning process. One of the top needs for our county, being a rural county in Arkansas, was broadband. Um, we have five school districts in our county of 33,000 people. And a majority of those districts had no access. Um, I'm not, I'm talking cell phone access, none, no access. So back at the start of the pandemic, our numbers were 65% of our county was online. 35% was not. And when the pandemic hit and schools had to close, everything went online. And you can imagine the calls that we received from parents, you know, because there was no access for them, um, period. We've had a problem with that before. You know, we've had high schoolers meeting at a local restaurant to use their Wi-Fi and do homework. So we knew this was a problem. And we know that libraries respond. We adapt to needs and to provide to the needs of our communities. So that's exactly what we did. When schools went online and our phones started blowing up, we thought, what can we do? Um, we do have an active hotspot checkout program with 50 hotspots that was in place. Those, we call them our box of puppies. Um, and literally it's such a needed service, but they are like puppies. They require a lot of care. Um, so we had our hotspot checkout program but we thought, how can we extend this further? Um, having a lot of rural areas in our community, um, we thought, you know, where could people gather? Where are people gathering now? Um, so, for example, one area of our county 
no gas stations. The only thing there is a church. Um, so we got with that church pastor. He had a meeting room there. Um, he opened it to the students. So that was friendship covered. That's one spot in our community where there is an access point for students. So we kept doing that. We went throughout the county. Um, we placed another hot spot at the train depot. Um, added a sign outside, community hot spot, and they were frequented. So we knew we needed more. So we kept doing that. Um, we we partnered with a local restaurant in Bismarck. Um, they offered to host that there for us, you know. And it's just signals coming out of the window and pull up. Here's the password. Kids doing homework in their cars, you know. But it provided the ability for them to do that. We also had some neighborhood sharing hotspots. So one house had a hotspot, it would reach to the entire neighborhood. Um, me as a librarian, that makes me super happy. Um, so we just kept on and we had a total of eight community hotspots around the county. Um, some of those are still up. We have come a long way since the pandemic regarding broadband infrastructure. Thank you to our county judge and some grant funding. So um, we also have our bookmobile that we used. So we hooked the bookmobile up with Wi-Fi and set that out. That goes throughout the county as well. And I wanna to touch on something that Dawn mentioned. I know we're here talking about access, but just like you said, the skills required to use internet. You know, how many times do we hear, I have no clue how to make an email. I don't even know how to turn this thing on. So libraries are filling that gap as well. And that is daily. Um, that is daily. We provide Tech Connect classes um, several times a month. We've had everything from patrons learning how to use to buy Bitcoin, um, one that was successful and bought us all pizza last week to an older gentleman just wanting to search for trailers to pull behind his truck. You know, so those are some optional things, but at the same time, we have people coming in, I need to get online to renew my housing. I'm 85 and the only other way I can do this is to call in and I've used all the minutes on my phone trying to do that. So, you know, we're talking about people's housing, um, the skills are required, the access is required. We're talking about health insurance. We're talking about job seeking. These are just such important things that people need um, to, to advance their quality of life and to be successful. Um, we also do a ton of scanning, copying, notarizing. Um, our libraries are just a one-shop stop for addressing the digital divide, making sure everybody has access to internet and the skills needed to use it. Um, we also offer an application assistance. As you're aware, many applications are online. Um, so I just think it's a huge piece, not only the access, but the tools and the skills needed. Um, and libraries are creative and we're responsive. So it was just a no brainer. Our community needs internet. Let's get it out there. I'm proud to, that we are able to do what we do. Fantastic. Uh, that's just great, Claire. Um, you, you, were, you just showed the kind of response, responsiveness and innovation to the community and the circumstance, which was pretty dire uh, as we right. all felt at the time. And then you started discovering things as you went along. And so now you've built a new, completely new connectivity structure for the, for the community. I think just wonderful. Uh, the, so the, all of the fixed uh, locations that you've supported, those are using the, the hot spots that you otherwise Correct. give for checkout. Correct. Same, yes. Same yes. Okay. And you yes. run those open. They're just, you know, there's a password somewhere that people can there see. There is a password posted on the window, along with a big sign that says community Wi-Fi hotspot. Okay. So. And it just takes them to the open internet. It doesn't go through the library or anything. Correct. Just the wow. open internet. 
And T-Mobile was the provider that had mm -hmm. coverage in areas throughout the county where there was none. Uh -huh. So it was already, you know, very used and very popular for that reason. But yes, met our needs fantastically. And how did, uh, have you worked with them? Is uh, T-Mobile kind of aware of what you're doing? Are they, do they care or are they helping at all? Um, I have not talked to them recently, uh, but I will do because their team is, is very um, responsive. And so yes, T-Mobile saved the day for us. Definitely. Just to provide that coverage. I'm sure so they'd like, to, I'm sure they'd like to hear that in public. Uh, but uh, that's great. That's this is terrific, Claire. We're so happy to to have you and and share your story. And uh, it's really a a, a, a tight, understandable thing that you've done, and it's just great. Uh, I, I I looked up Hot Spring County is something thirty something thousand people, and uh, so we're gonna jump from uh, a very uh, rural area to I guess the most urban area in the country in New York City and Garfield Swabby is on to uh, tell us what he's doing there so we'll come back for some questions uh, a little bit later and uh, for the moment we will welcome Garfield to share his screen and unmute and uh, talk to us the, about this the, wireless project you're doing it just it could, these are three really different circumstances. We've got a small county in Arkansas. We've got the densest urban area in the country. And then we'll have Orange County in Florida, which is a big spread out county of three million people. So Garfield, tell us about this project that, that caught our attention and, and what you're doing with it and where you think it's going. Welcome. Welcome. Th thank you, uh, Don, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Garfield Swaby, uh, Vice President of IT uh, here at the New York Public Library. Uh, yeah, there we go. So uh, as a result of the lockdown, uh, we're, we're not, uh, as Don mentioned, a, a rural library, uh, but we heard nonetheless that during the lockdown, kids were walking up to our steps to try to get Wi-Fi bleed. And uh, that wasn't just isolated, uh, that, was, that was a thing. And so library leadership, well, let me step back and just talk, set some context for New York City and the New York Public Library. In New York City, there are three library systems. Brooklyn uh, has its own, Queen has its own. NYPL covers the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island. Uh, and together, we have quite a number of neighborhood branches. Uh, for NYPL, we have 88 neighborhood branches. Then we also have a, under our uh, umbrella, a research library component, similar to like a university. So we have uh, that big iconic building on Fifth Avenue. That's one of our research libraries. We have a, uh, a performing arts library. We have the Schomburg uh, Library for Black Arts and Culture. And right across the street from uh, where I'm sitting here uh, on Fifth Avenue is, uh, is housed uh, the Science, Industry, and Business Library. So altogether about 92 locations. Uh, when uh, word came that uh, kids were, you know, in, in New York City, you can imagine uh, uh, obscene wealth and the far opposite. And so we do have coverage uh, for a good number of New Yorkers, but there's still quite a large uh, amount of people who live within New York City who, quite frankly, do not have connectivity. Anything, uh, uh, you know, that other than maybe a cell phone, and, uh, you know, as most of you know, you can't really do homework on a cell phone. You can't do coding classes on a cell phone. So a uh, number of donors reached out to us and, uh the library leadership had always come to me. It was like an annual uh, event. The question, well, Garfield, how do we expand or extend what we're doing in those 88 or 92 locations out to the, to, to the neighborhoods? And how do we do that? Because we're resource challenged uh, with as little money as possible, but with maximal effect. Uh, effect. 
and the answer was always given, uh, you know, certainly Wi-Fi technology, not too far. Like, you know, you can put a, a device on the buildings and, and, and broadcast that, but it's only going to get uh, in a New York block, maybe to halfway uh, to the end of the block before things started uh, functioning. Uh, so my response was, uh, for this, can't really do anything with the uh, current technology, the technology that we're aware of. But given the dire scenario that you know the pandemic uh, brought to light, I said, you know, give us uh, some time. Let us do some research. See what's happening uh, in certainly around five G and you know any type of new technology. So we heard about a school district in Utah. And whenever I give these talks, I always shout out Jason Ayer uh, from the Murray School District in, in uh, close to Salt Lake City. As he was open enough to sit down with us to talk about his project. And he had used CBRS to light up uh, the campus for the, you know, for the school districts. And as we were talking, like in just, you know, a, a, an offhand comment, he said, you know, if we had to do it much better, if we had to do it all over again, we would have sent uh, these uh, devices home with kids and then uh, had them use it at home. And so I said, so how far can you, you know, can your signal get to the homes? And it's like a mile, I'm like a mile. Uh, obviously, Utah is different from New York City. But, uh, you know, so but but just using and, 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 and looking at what he was able to do with his team, the type of innovation he was able to do, you know, we realized that we could do probably do something similar, but instead of uh, telling our leadership, let's let's go and do it since someone else tried it and we're succeeding, we said we're going to structure uh, our project as a trial. And you know, for folks who are in in uh, in tech, they know if you say pilot, folks figure once it's done, you know, you implement it. So our thing was, it's a trial. We have some things that we want, some questions that we want to answer. Uh, to, about the technology itself, about whether or not we can sustain it, you know, so can we deploy it through all of our locations? What will the people who we want to use a device, what are they going to uh, experience? New York City has uh, a, an unfortunate uh, history of companies coming in with uh, rebates and, and, and with government uh, programs and those things are done for a few years and then they once the funding finishes they leave and those communities have quite frankly grown weary of these types of ex uh, experiments and so we wanted to make sure that whatever we do with the technology that it would be meaningful that there would be some impact uh, in, term, in, 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 in their experience of the technology and then we also wanted to make sure that we will, would be able to work with folks in the community to embrace the technology and uh, and use it and not fall prey to you know to what I mentioned before. So we you know we set off with our trial. Uh, this is a list of uh, uh, at the end of the trial we ended up with five locations. We started uh, with eight. Uh, it got whittled down to as many as two or three. Some of the companies that we worked with uh, because of CBRS, and, and I'll talk a little bit about CBRS, what it is, and and why we decided to uh, to, to 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 trial this. But we ended up uh, with five locations for the trial. Uh, so CBRS was is a fairly new technology that the F, the FCC only recently wrote up the specifications about it. It's in a certain uh, part of the, uh, the spectrum. Uh, normally what the FCC would do is to, uh, I, to, I, to uh, specify a specific uh, technology for that part of the spectrum. CBRS was unique in that uh, cellular sig signals, Wi-Fi signals, any kind, all, any type of uh, wireless signals can operate in that band, in that frequency. And there was also an, another uh, important change in the way that the FCC provided uh, dual specifications. It uh, allowed a tiered access uh, 
uh, for people who could play. So it wasn't only a space for the traditional incumbents to operate, but there was a, a, a tier four incumbent. So for the, the spectrum was initially owned by the military, you know, so uh, uh, sub, uh, submarines as they travel up and down the coast, they utilize that part of the spectrum for their communications. So uh, the, the, the CBRS spectrum band still allowed for the incumbents to operate. There was also a second tier for the traditional uh, providers, but there was a third tier called general uh, access that was open to any organization who could afford to buy the radios put it on their, uh, their roofs, buy the, the devices to pick up those signals and use it. And so what we find with CBRS, uh, it's used, for example, in stadiums. So if you ever wonder how, when you, if you're in a stadium now, all of a sudden you're able to get like good, real reliable signals. Normally it's because of CBRS or what they're, they call private, uh, uh, private cellular. So we structured our trial to be similar uh, to a bake-off. We assigned uh, a, libra a, a library to a particular vendor, invited them to install their, their, their antennas. We then uh, provided uh, what we call lending kits. Uh, you go to, to show you what the lending kits look like. We provided lending kits in like those red bags and loaned them to uh, uh, patrons who lived within certain radius who were able to pick up the signals. And the point was, uh, we, we asked them to go home, uh, plug it in, turn it on. Uh, if you could you probably notice on uh, the top left and middle uh, and top middle, those are two different devices that we loaned in the, in the landing kits along with a Chromebook. Because it was, you know, for us, it wasn't just a matter of having a signal. We wanted to make sure that if folks did not have a device uh, uh, at home, that they would at least be able to use that. And you know, included all the connection uh, information that a patient would need. So uh, we, we uh, uh, well, yeah, let me talk about uh, some of these locations that didn't actually make it through the trial. And, you know, for again, we were trying to learn the technology, trying to learn the vendor capabilities. And in some cases, we decided not to continue with vendors because quite frankly, the, the, air, the library that they were assigned just would not allow for a good reception. And no matter what they did in, 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 in those uh, uh, spaces, you know, they weren't able to guarantee at least broadband speeds. And so we had to pull those locations uh, from the trial. In, in other uh, scenarios, we, we decided to, to move away from vendors because the aspects that they thought was important to, uh, to illustrate or demonstrate wasn't what we necessarily cared about for this particular trial. So, you know, some things, uh, were you know are important down the road, but you know from our standpoint, what we needed to test was CBRS's viability in an urban environment like New York City, and can we get that to to, to operate or not? Can we broadcast the signal reliably or not into people's homes? How far can we get there? And quite frankly, like you know what's you know what what do we learn from that from the uh, vendor experience. I, I will also say, you know, libraries, most of you know, we don't normally venture into technology at this part of the maturity curve, right? We normally do it after technology is proven and, you know, folks know how it works. Uh, in, in this space, we were actually learning at, at the same time as the vendors themselves. So a lot of the technology uh, was, was quite frankly new they weren't uh, on the level that uh, that you know we would consider to be prime time, and as a result, we had to uh, we have developers that work work here. We developed an app 
uh, that allowed us to really combine all different use cases that was a part of this that would not be like a use case inside of a, uh, a stadium or inside, you know, or for a real estate management company. So we needed to uh, talk about how to check out or check in devices. Uh, we needed to be able to see the devices on a map and see how many were check, checked in, how many were operating, uh, we needed to uh, run reports just to, to, to understand who was using it. Uh, we realized that there were uh, some individuals that were misusing uh, the technology and misusing the spectrum. We had to make adjustments there. But uh, having four or five different uh, vendors uh, with, without one comprehensive system to manage it all was a, a real big pain point. And so we went from uh, we we went from having multiple vendor systems to the need for what we call a single pane of glass solution. So that's what we're actually looking for now, uh, uh, you know. And, and that's those are some scenarios for you know from us here in New York City. We don't think the technology is at a is at a point where we can operate at scale and deploy one vendor solution in all of our locations. So what we're really looking at, uh, you know, can we find a, a vendor that has a good reliable radio that will work with a different home device and how do we like wrap all of that uh, in just one comprehensive management system? And so we came up with this, we're having conversations now with vendors about looking at how can they address some of these uh, use cases that, uh, you know, we found to be uh, uh, important for deploying uh, the system. Garfield, uh, before you... I'll do, well, yes, what, what I wanted to talk about, the, the importance of, of the trial was that in uh, where uh, the Schomburg is in Harlem and where the Grand Concourse Library is in, in the Bronx, as you could see, two different, uh, the, the colored areas, the, the coverage map for each of those signals. In each scenario, there's a hospital right across the street from each of them, but we got just different uh, coverage maps and, and coverage capabilities for the technology. So, you know, what, what we've realized is that, uh, I'll, I'll leave the CBRS in the box for, for questions and answers if, if, if we, we get them. What we realize is that under the right conditions, CBRS, you know, can be reliably broadcast uh, to patrons Patrons are willing to come to the libraries to borrow those things. Uh, anchor institutions like libraries need to start thinking of themselves to be central to the broadband digital divide question and not just uh, play the role of being a distribution point. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, real estate, we have skills, we have the technologies and we have the ability to build community partnerships. Those are important things for building reliable community broadband. Uh, the, the, the community trusts libraries for what they do. Uh, you know, I always tell my team, no one comes to the library because they were fascinated with a computer. They come because of the librarians and that experience. So, uh, you know, we have to build and, and uh, build off of that. Uh, and, you know, so we, we, uh, you know, we think the, the, the solution has some promise. It needs some work. Uh, for us here at NYPL, we've adopted CBRS as a core service, but we don't think in and of itself, it has, uh, that it can solve the, the, the digital divide problem on its own. So we're looking to uh, add it to our portfolio, but also look at other types of technologies to be able to, to bring that to bear. We have some uh, some some good news. Uh, can't really share it yet, uh, but just to say that we're a we'll now be moving to uh, to to manage broadband inside of affordable housing buildings, and so we're working with a New York City organization that will give us entree into buildings actually run and deploy uh, broadband inside of those affordable housing buildings and. You know, we think there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of traction that we're getting. And, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll keep you guys posted on, on our uh, progress. Uh, I'll stop here and...
This is, this is just a great story. I mean, uh, you, you, I, I love your point about making the clear distinction between a pilot and a trial. Because <laughs> expectations are so important in what people think, you know, is doing. And so it seems like you position the library as a laboratory. You're doing an open experiment for, you know, you're declaring why and all that and how. And so the the standard is not like, oh, you're just not as good as Verizon. Why are you even trying to, you know, it's very, very different. It's a very, very impressive uh, story. I look so forward to hearing how, you know, the next stage goes and the opportunity to do dense connectivity and uh, connect to these dense uh, environments like housing is, is really wide open. And so you basically addressed all three of the barriers, you know, the, the usability, traditional library, <laughs> affordability, that's library 101, and now connectivity or the uh, availability, you're addressing that. So, so impressive. We'll, we'll try to get back and we have some time for questions at the end. I've got a couple for you, but <laughs> we're, we're going to ask Dan to come on here and uh, tell us about uh, uh, Wi-Fi on Wheels in Orange County, California. Dan, welcome. Unmute and uh, tell us what's happening. Thank you so much for having me here, Don. I really appreciate it. Um, can you guys hear me clearly? Just fine. Awesome. Wonderful. Yeah, uh, my name is Dan Serenolia. I'm the Marketing and Communications Library Manager for the OC Public Library System in Southern California. Uh, basically, back during the pandemic, um, we had an initiative which we started in 2020, and our goal was to uh, start a program called Wi-Fi on Wheels. And we focused on our primary uh, branch in uh, Westminster, which is like an underserved community with a uh, kind of um, a challenging socioeconomic status. And what we had was we had uh, staff uh, drive out with our uh, our vehicles and project Wi-Fi at various locations, uh, various neighborhoods and local parks. And we did it all day. Um, and we had that pilot program from 2020 through 2021. And it was just really great for the community. We were able to provide um, internet access to uh, families, uh, low-income families who needed access to that type of um, technology. And what really is cool about it is it was like basically a temporary solution at the time, which led to a very permanent idea, which we implement now, which is uh, our mobile library. So what we did is we transitioned from having the Wi-Fi on wheels to our more permanent um a more permanent um, service, which is called the mobile library. It's run by um, our manager, Nancy Paya. She's wonderful. And basically her and her team, they go out to various um, areas of our uh, the community, specifically uh, within our county system. And they'll go to senior community centers, parks, and um, like boys and girls clubs. And they'll provide um, a wider range of library services, which include uh, just programs uh, focusing on literacy and art, and then also have library materials and also uh, Wi-Fi hotspots to check out, which are very popular here in our system. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you for a brief moment um, and then just show you uh, some photos I have here. Uh, those are my kids. <laughs> Let me show you. Uh, uh, can you see that first uh, image on the screen right there? It's from our, yes. um, our Wi-Fi on wheels truck, which we had uh, back in 2020. And basically, you'd uh, project the, the signal throughout the various uh, regions we're uh, focusing on, which in this case was Westminster. And then um, that's our staff member, Sal Cervantes, just setting up the equipment and the gear. And um, yeah, him uh, packing it up at the end of the day. And then now we have our uh, mobile library. So uh, just an example, we have our two staff members, uh, Daniel and James, setting up art supplies for an art program. And then that's just James uh, wrapping it up at the end. And also I just wanted uh, to show you guys a little uh, brief uh, um, video from our uh, social media. We got like um, our uh, two truck, our trucks here, newly wrapped, and um, they're just uh, traveling throughout the community, trying to you know offer free services, working with uh, our different community partners, and just um, it's just a really good service for everyone. Um, our staff is very dedicated. Uh, they're very hardworking and talented, and not only they're knowledgeable about li you know librarianship, how to offer free services and technology, but also they're just uh, there to promote literacy. So obviously we're a library. We love books. And we're trying to get that throughout the community to uh, places that are kind of underserved. So that's our, uh, yeah, that's our mobile library. And um, let me wrap that and stop the screen sharing. And yeah, that is it. That's that's what we have, our Wi-Fi on Wheels program, mobile library. Um, we don't want to take too much time, so we have time for questions. But that was uh, that's what we offer and what we uh, have for the rest of the community down here in Orange County. Very Thank cool. <laughs> so it's like... Uh... A mini bookmobile without books. 
right? I mean, do you have bookmobiles in the county? Oh, yeah. Um, so the uh, mobile library does, uh, we have, we offer book services. So we have like a stand up, a kiosk, and we check out books uh, at each location. So it's like fully stocked, basically. Okay. So these are all mobile. You, you've gone mobile with services and a way to distribute devices as well as Wi-Fi, of course and uh, various kinds of electronics, like the checkout hotspots. Very, very cool idea to, to get out and make people aware of these things right in the neighborhood, as opposed to putting a sign in the branch library, you know, come and get it. We're coming to you. So that's, that's great. That's real initiative. And it's also impressive how, you know, one thing leads to another. You discover things when you try things out. You learn, you get ideas, you try those out. You go, well, this is good. This is popular. We're going to keep this. We'll keep going. So... That's uh, that's great. Uh, are you looking at uh, fixing any of those hotspots? You know, just setting up permanent hotspots like uh, like Claire's doing or Garfield is doing. Yeah, for um, our initiative uh, back in 2020, we had that like uh, kind of fixed station for like a, a full eight hour day for uh, for those uh, areas. Now we're more focusing on um, our 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 resources on those. Uh, not like on the books and the programs, but for the hotspots, it's just more like things that uh, patrons can check out individually. So things like that. That's what we're trying to like get out to the community. Right. How, how many uh, checkout hotspots are in the system, your system? Ooh, Don, let me look that up. Uh, we had a grant before we had several hundred, but then uh, with, when the grant was with, uh, drawn and ended, we, uh, I think our, our stock was cut in half. So it's, I don't know the exact number. I'm going to look that up, but basically they're always in a queue, always on hold. Um, and they're really super popular. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a challenge. They're, they're really great and, but they're, they cost. And so how, how are they sustainable? It's, it's going, it's going to continue to be a challenge because they, they don't grow less popular. They grow more popular and, uh, and it doesn't seem like they're lowering the prices on these either. So, but it's a great initiative, and I'm sure the community is appreciating it. Um, uh, Garfield? Oh no, yeah, Garfield. Sorry, uh, you mentioned the kits that you're that you're distributing. Uh, are those access points that you're letting people use? Are they just for that household, or is it for a, a neighborhood? Or are they do they run open, or are they just for the like a checkout house spot just for the user. Yeah, so uh, for for this case, for the trial, it was just for that household. Uh, uh -huh. One of the things that we're exploring though, uh, as we think about affordable housing buildings is creating, uh, you know, open air uh, spaces like uh, a cafe, uh, maybe in the lobby where folks can have uh, open access to that. Uh, we've also, there's a device that I, uh, that I scroll through, we call it CBRS in a box. You know, branding is not our right. our, our, uh, our core competency, but it's a similar uh, scenario as, as dance. And so it's it's a kit that's all in one. The idea is you turn it on and you, you can provide uh, connectivity for, you know, for anywhere from four to 10 uh, users. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're thinking about uh, putting those with some of our bookmobiles so that uh, as they go out, they can provide that uh, as part of the service. But also we, we had a scenario where our fiber was cut in the office where uh, the IT headquarters was. And there's a, a library for, for the blind in that building. We're able to wheel that device and allow folks to, you know, to just continue business. So it has some, you know, some interesting uh, use cases. Uh, and so, as, you know, as we think about how uh, th this phase of the, of, the, of the program, of the project, our, our purpose is folks should just be able to see NYPL wireless and connect uh, uh, to that signal, regardless of whether they borrowed uh, a kit from the library or using their own devices. And so that's what we're focusing on now, NYPL wireless as just a signal that should be uh, ubiquitous throughout at least our coverage area. Lots of challenges and in a, you know, technology is a very dynamic environment. So, you know, in the middle of the project, there's an update, an upgrade, you know, offered to you and you're going, well, I'm just trying to get my hands on the last edition yeah. of technology. 
So uh, hats off to you for uh, taking on a challenge like that. Uh, there was a question about uh, satellite technology. So uh, I thought I'd take a shot at that. I mentioned low Earth orbit satellites, trying to make the distinction between geostationary satellites. So right now, Starlink is the, I think the only one. There's OneWeb is about to enter and offer services. I don't know their business model exactly. Uh, Starlink has been around now and it's offering services to end users and to businesses and enterprises. And so they have a scale of services and prices according to the use. The, the home service, which is the kind of the standard service, is uh, in the U.S. It's $110 a month, I believe. Uh, but it's pretty fast. I mean, uh, these things run at, you know, at a, at a, a couple of hundred megabits per second. Uh, and they're not susceptible to outage. I mean, if you have a, a battery, basically they, they don't require much electricity, pretty much the uh, uh, electricity to drive a light bulb, you know, 150, 200 watts. You can run one of these things. Uh, the dish is, uh, you know, something like that. And they're, uh, the dishes are uh, move because they have to orient themselves to the, to the pattern of the satellites overhead. Uh, and, well, it's a good point, Jessica makes. They don't offer a static IP, which can create uh, issues for uh, network management. But just as an endpoint, just as an IP, uh, they're pretty sweet, though there are issues with it, and the cost is not nothing. And they have not uh, applied for E-rate uh, vendor provider status. So uh, I, I think they will. There's something they can do on request, but as a general rule, they're not an eligible provider. But you know, you can you can talk with them about it. I think they have solutions for that on a one-off basis. And the the strength of it, it just goes anywhere. I mean, literally anywhere on the planet, you can connect to high-performance broadband. So that's really something. There's been a lot of talk about how they would hold up over time and all that. So a lot of doubters, but it seems to be, seem to be working pretty well. And they've just done a, a partnership. It hasn't rolled out yet with T-Mobile to be able to connect directly to a phone. Though these are supposed to be low bit application, you know, text and email, not uh, streaming video, but having connection where there's no connection, you know, it's like <laughs> the value, we say the value of the first megabit is greater than the value of the next 999 megabits, because basic connectivity is extremely valuable, especially compared to no connectivity. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, I was just going to comment that the, the challenges of operating a wireless network inside of Manhattan have got to be, or New York's greater metro area, it's got to be just daunting. Every possible provider is there using every possible uh, frequency level, which, you know, tend to create interference. Wi-Fi has to contract. If it, if it hears, the radios hear other, too much other Wi-Fi nearby, they reduce the power of their, of their signal. That's why, you know, it should work, but it doesn't seem to work. Usually it's because there are a bunch of other routers just right beside you. So uh, it kind of shrinks the range of Wi-Fi even more than it already is. Um, yeah, that, that's why CBRS, I think, it's, uh, has so much promise. It uh, operates on a completely different part of the spectrum. You could do right. a lot in terms of uh, pattern shaping. And, you know, so it, it can work uh, certainly with uh, Wi-Fi 6 have amazing applications and you know we see a, a number of factories and and other folks who are putting it to good use in inside of their buildings you know primarily because of that uh, the fixed wireless use case is even a more challenging one that to try to broadcast it not within a building but but outside but i think you know there's uh, we're just looking for the right mix to, uh, to be able to solve the the, the concerns that we have Competing frequencies, lots of buildings, lots yeah. of wires and towers. It's such a such a complicated environment. Uh, we're at our hour here, uh, and so we, we want to wrap up. We're not 
we're not like a TV show. We don't have a, you know, we don't have to stop on the hour, but we, we respect everybody's time here. Uh, so I'd like to go back to Claire and ask Claire if she has any kind of closing remark for us, Claire. Uh, anything you want to leave us with? I am just um, really excited to have been part of this discussion. And I've learned a lot today, too. So um, thank you for that. Well, More great. I can take back to my patrons and my community. So I well, appreciate it. Thank you. And, and take back our uh, appreciation and our congratulations on uh, their library and all the services they're getting from their library. They should Thank you. They should uh, appreciate you even more, we think. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's, that's great. Uh, we look forward to keeping track of the project. Uh, Dan, uh, last word? Yeah, I just want to thank you all again for the opportunity to share like our services that we offer here at OC Public Libraries. I want to thank uh, Claire and uh, Garfield again for their information that they shared. I learned a, a lot as well. And um, something I hope to take back to my system regarding um, all the information that was uh, just given today. And I appreciate you all. Thank you. Great. Thank you again. Uh, we should have the recording up uh, tomorrow. We'll send out the link to that. And uh, we usually get a lot of people uh, watching these, you know, in conflict of time or, you know, usually there's a lot of information like today and people go, well, I didn't get all of that. So I want to see it again or parts of it. So uh, uh, it should be available for, for looking at. Uh, Garfield, I'm going to give you a, a, the last word here, but also there was a question about from Jessica about uh, TV frequencies. I, I think she's referring to TV white space, which I doubt is available in Manhattan. We used to work with that. It's the, it's the empty uh, bands between the assigned bands on TV broadcast that can be used for, for two-way communication. Uh, it's been a complicated regulatory thing, uh, and it hasn't really proven to be uh, well, as effective as CBRS. CBRS has come up and kind of displaced TV white space as a prospective new technology. Did you even talk about that or think about it or look at it? So we, we had uh, a couple of folks who, who uh, proposed it and have solutions for it. I think it's probably better placed with school districts. Uh, uh, you know, so we there's an application for it, but not quite the one that we, we were thinking about CBRS is probably right. more more to that note but good i think good. anything anything that can uh, can address the digital divide is worth exploring it's just a matter of identifying you know the particular problem aspect of the the overall uh, problem that you want to uh, address we'll focus on that and then see how you can expand word and let, let me also thank uh, the other two collaborators today i certainly learned a lot from uh, from you too as well and thank you, Don, for the opportunity. Okay. Well, you guys have just given us a, the broadest scope of environments to deal with a common problem. The problem is the same. People need access. They need support. And and you're providing it. So kudos to all of you and your systems. Uh, congratulations. And we'll try to keep track of, of what's going on and have you all back. So with that, we're going to call this a... Uh, a session and I'm stopping the recording now.